this video I want to dig into the contacts and accounts modules in FM Starting Point once again at a deeper level. So first off, accounts in FM Starting Point are companies and this could say company uh, but a lot of people refer to these as accounts but they are fundamentally non-living entities. They are organizations or companies. Okay, Contacts are people but they are not necessarily customers. This is the only database in the system that is storing people, live bodies, humans, that type of thing. So the first thing that comes to mind is that a lot of people don't differentiate between companies and contacts because the organization is sufficiently small enough that this is not really an issue. Even within RCC, even though that we have 25 staff and we're busily doing quite a bit of work, we really don't, in our internal database, don't split out companies and contacts. We can have contacts and we can have many of them for one company. Say for example we know people at Apple Computer or Apple Inc these days, right? And we'll have a number of those people that belong to Apple and so if we do a search for Apple in our contacts database there'll be a number of them but we don't have a separate company database or accounts database where we have one Apple record. If we did that operationally we don't have a purpose for doing that. It doesn't serve any positive role for us to do that. Uh, we don't have a single salesperson or a single engineer that's just responsible for all the Apple work. It doesn't work that way within our organization where there's no practical purpose for that. So organizationally there's no benefit so we don't run our organization that way. For that reason if you take FM starting point and you're going to deploy it, you need to decide whether you're actually going to keep the accounts module or you're going to dump it. Now, of course, dumping modules in FM starting point, the easiest thing to do initially is just to go into layout mode and to remove them off a of screen. Now, we haven't got into, in this training series yet, going into layout mode and making alterations and things like that. So if you're not familiar with what I'm saying, just take my word for it that it's easy enough just to visibly make the alteration to remove it off screen and not go into the system underneath the guts and actually delete the programming out from the system. Just remove the references on screen to accounts. That way someday if you want to go back and add it, all you have to do is for example paste the accounts button back on screen here because the account system is still in the system under the hood. So it's still there. So here we can see right here one of those moments where people get confused whether we have contacts or accounts. I've cross-labeled the account field here. In field definitions we've labeled all these fields as accounts but don't let that throw you. They are in fact company. In fact if you want to go through the system and relabel them company you can do that. That's not a big deal. That being said the default behavior for FM starting point is the name account name. Now they are relationally connected. We talk about the basics ideas of relationships and structures and things in one of the videos coming up. That being said, I can go to browse mode right here and jump to accounts. And this is the account screen right here. So we can do without this to be completely honest with you. It just depends on the business and the level of sophistication of a business. If you have a business and you have territories with sales reps that are divided up by company, then you're going to want to keep the account module separated where you can actually assign staff to the company. You would put a staff uh, field in here and you would assign a staff or several staff to that specific organization or company. Now from a under the hood perspective, if I go into manage database, each of these ACC accounts and CON contacts, structurally they're very similar. ID underscore contact is your main key field that drives unique serial numbers for this table. Same thing in accounts, ID underscore account and the same sort of situation. Starting in starting point four, we started setting it up so we put a short version of the table name as the leading part of the key. So as you create new keys, the table name will be in the key. So if someone gives you a key, you can frequently tell what table it came from. So if someone says to you, I have this ID of this screen, what is the ID on the screen? And they say to you, 
ACT155, and but they told you they're on the contact screen, you know that they are very confused because the ACT key comes from the uh, account, right? So we go to accounts. You know that definitely didn't come from contacts. Uh, so we go from ID account, which is set to be auto serial right here. And it's ACT, exactly. So that's a dead giveaway that you have a unique key and those keys are specific to those tables. Instead of it just being a generic number, you have kind of this breadcrumb or kind of a clue as to what table generated it. So once again, if you're not familiar with tables and structure of databases, maybe you want to skip this section of videos, go learn about how databases are constructed a little bit in the next section, and then come back and watch this set of videos. So that gives you a little bit of idea of how this is set up. Relationship structuring for accounts and contacts, once again we mentioned in the next section that we're using the anchor buoy methodology. Uh, this is all set up in here. We try to keep it fairly well organized and specifically accounts and contacts is very important. We also talk about our naming conventions which are a little bit unique to us but they're pretty straightforward. Of course you feel free to use a different naming convention if you like but we have all the layouts tied to a main table occurrence and that's on the left side of the anchor buoy methodology and that are all these TO1s, TO2, TO3 and that all corresponds to this yellow box right here. Then everything off of this are our child relationships and these are all the supporting things that we need to drive this main table occurrence right here which happens to drive all our account based layouts. It's a very simple straightforward system Sometimes it has some drawbacks, but in terms of mentally keeping it straight and all together, Anchor Buoy is really great for that. So once again, we're using our ID account quite a bit. Sometimes we're using other things, but ID account quite a bit. TO5 for contact, same sort of situation. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the overall structure for these. Now let's dive back into under the hood with the contacts and accounts. So contacts and accounts are organized fairly similarly. I'm going to focus on accounts primarily. So across the top we have our primary navigation section up here across the top. Then we have our primary tabs right here. And down below here we have our secondary navigation here. Now from table to table or module to module, once again I use the term modules sometimes with users because when I say table, they have no idea what I'm talking about. But if I say it's a module in a system or a software system or in a solution module, they kind of get, oh, well, that's a piece of software and it's kind of self-contained. They get that. Talking about tables, they're lost. So in the context module, we have a number of supporting elements that are related to the context module. We bury those in secondary navigation. Now at the top we have the detail entry page which is all under contact details. We have the supporting list view. As you build the solution or customize it you're going to want to change the fields in the list view or expand it or whatever you want to do. We used a couple alternating colors here a little bit. You could do more work in that area if you like. We put the table view in here as a courtesy I generally despise the table view unless I am troubleshooting the software and I'm reverse engineering a problem. As a typical user, I almost never use it. I use it only as a developer when I'm trying to debug something. The email menu we actually use internally quite a bit for different things. This is basically where you can have pre-canned emails here. You bring up the pre-canned email, you can customize the email, and then as you send the email out, these merge fields here, they look like merge fields, they act like merge fields, uh, we run the substitute command, once again there's a video about that, we run the substitute command or substitute function I should say, and it swaps out the first name uh, of this record and it sends it out. Now how does it know to send it out? Well, it sends it out via the settings that we set up in preferences over here. 
So that's how you know how to set it up. Is the email client or SMTP server? There's another video on that topic right there. So that's how this works right here. Now you can have a whole array of different emails in here. In fact, I have another video where we had so many emails, we had to have different like little topics up here, what kind of email we were talking about. So um, that was kind of handy. We'll show you how we did that. It's not built into starting point, but we can show you how that was uh, kind of set up. It's a little fun. So that is the navigation across the front. Uh, we have a mapping system here. Uh, this is kind of a hack a little bit, only from the standpoint that Google keeps changing their API and the URLs that they use for rendering the maps. And as a result, the map system periodically breaks, which is kind of a hassle and uh, something that I'm not really fond of that Google does this. I'm not sure what their intention is or why they're doing that. In this case, we're not generating a map. The primary issue with the map is that we don't have any lat and long coordinates here. If you see this column right here, lat and long, um, the map system I think is currently disabled. The lat and longs will be, once again, they're managed by coming over here and setting up the options. And you have to uh, turn this on, use current location, auto-generate coordinates. Yeah, you got to turn this on. And what happens when you turn on auto-generate coordinates, as the users are bouncing around and they make a change in the street here, uh, they click out. What happens is, is that the system will go out to, I think you have to make actually a change to the field. And there's a little bit of a pause here. And there it is, and it updated right there. As you make changes to this, it goes out to Google and gets fresh GPS coordinates. Right, so it got the fresh GPS coordinates right there. Now most of the records in our system here don't have GPS coordinates. There's no lat and long. Now see it generated the map because it finally had eight, at least one lat and long to generate for this imaginary address. All these data in here is all bogus addresses, but uh, that is apparently a magical real address somewhere uh, within California. The idea is that it generates these lat and longs kind of as you go. And so you get these all generated. If that's not turned on, then the Latin longs won't be in the system. You can see that they're being created automatically by this right here. Now you can hide this, but this is kind of like one of those little parakeet in the coal mine situations where if this isn't showing up, then the Latin longs aren't being found. Now the Latin longs are being generated in real time from Google. That means you have to have a live internet connection. No internet connection, no GPS. So it's one of those kind of things. Of course, the map won't work without an internet connection anyway. So it's one of those ideas just to kind of keep in mind. The other issue is, is that Google will only allow you to do so many pings off an IP address over the course of a 24-hour period. Ah, right? And so if you do more than about 1,200 over the course of a 24-hour period, Google will start to block you. We had customers who were doing all this data entry and I can get these tech support emails and they say, oh, you know, your system was really great, fantastic, we love you, but after, you know, a period of time, the mapping quit working. And it turns out that they were doing a ton of data entry and they had some temps that were hired and they were doing all this data entry and suddenly they hit their max and they were getting blanks in their GPS coordinates which would cause those not to be updated. Well, they ended up having to buy an account with Google and pay for that service, or they had to wait till other days and then refresh those addresses, and there's a script you can do to refresh that. That's how the map system works. It has to have Latin long, and if you're actually on an iPad, it also can get your current GPS coordinates and show you where you're at relative to that. So we'll have more of a detailed video on the mapping at some point later on in this training. But that's just to give you a little heads up on that when people say, hey, why isn't anything showing up? You have to have Latin long, at least one on here. And the system is going to map against the found set in here up to a maximum number of records in that found set, the first 10 viewable records. Now you can change that to more records, but if you try to pump through 125,000 Latin long coordinates, I'm pretty sure Google's gonna choke and toss you an error. I don't know how many Latin long coordinates you can send on a map before it explodes. I did have a customer who tried to send 40,000 and the thing ground away for about 30 minutes before it kicked back a map. So you might want to be cautious about doing that. So that's the primary navigation and contacts. Secondary navigation, once again pretty straightforward. 
communication and notes. These are multiple notes, but you can click on one and it's actually driven by two different relationships. The one relationship actually shows you all the records right here, but if you click in one of these or you click this button right here, it activates a second relationship which is the current note relationship and that drives this note over here which allows you to see the details. So there's actually two relationships that are driving this right here. Okay, Pretty slick. This comes out of the communication notes table. This comes out of the counts or company table as you would expect. This is super straightforward. As you would expect this comes out of the estimates table very straightforward. We have another training video on caching your calculations and your summaries but as you can see right here you think that maybe this is broke please press the update total button to get the latest information right here. Invoices same thing this is the related invoices related projects related to-do items if you're trying to manage some action items or to-do items this is the table where that information is stored here. Digital documents. This is the remote container storage or container storage with remote storage. This is the capabilities that were new in FileMaker 12 that have been improved with FileMaker 13 and conceptually are somewhat similar to super container if you're familiar with that technology. We've wired this up to improve this so you can press the open button right here and it will bring this document actually up and made visible. That capability right there is not native in FileMaker and I begged and pleaded for this but they didn't want to put this in. I'm not entirely sure why. I think it was actually a little bit too much work for them. But the ability to press a button and actually bring it up requires you to script it. Now you still have the ability to right click here on this graphic so you can export or import or do all sorts of things here with that container. We put six of these across here Plus we have a slide control at the bottom so you can actually uh, have three different uh, sets of these. So there's quite a few containers here that you have access to. And lastly we actually have an addresses tab for additional addresses and this is pretty empty so you can do all sorts of things with this tab right here. The account section is pretty similar as well. Similar tabs, in fact basically identical tabs across the bottom. I'm not going to dig through that. The one exception is the products tab and this is the products that are attached to this account and this would be if this account or company was a vendor a vendor of this product they manufactured this product and so you might have that situation here in this case uh, Richard Carlin Consulting is a vendor and they make this pin kind of weird it doesn't entirely make sense in this sort of situation but that's kind of what this is conceptually set up to be or maybe they're a distributor and then pilot corporation is a manufacturer so it might be a distributor situation it's just a matter of how you want to set this up and customize it but once again accounts and contacts setup is very similar structures very similar there's no email or mapping function up here and in fact a lot of people are going to leave the accounts module out so there you go Hopefully that answers some detailed questions about these modules.